Hi, everyone, and welcome to what we're going to call officially episode one, this podcast that we're doing called Emile Mux Takeout. Hey, it's my takes on all things about race, society, politics, and diversity, and everything that those things touch in our culture and society. Uh, so how's that for narrow casting? Uh, I'm Emil Guillermo, I'm your host, and on this first episode, it occurs on the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, the executive order that began the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. This also happens to be President's Weekend, which comes at a time when the current White House resident, Trump 45, is extremely executive order happy and has some fearing that we could have a EO 9066 all over again. I mean, it is all relevant again. I mean, the president takes claim for the stock market's rise, but he should also take credit for the rise in hate and xenophobia that we're seeing around the country. So on this 75th anniversary of 9066, what the Japanese American community has called a day of remembrance for some time now, the politics has made it a different day in 2017. It requires a history lesson, which is why I called on an old friend, Phil Tajitsu Nash, a lawyer, activist, journalist, a board member of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and an Asian American history prof at the University of Maryland. I asked him to come on and talk about 9066. Enjoy the conversation. Phil Tajitsu Nash is a friend, a scholar, a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of Maryland in College Park, and a former colleague of mine at Asian Week, which was the premier national Asian American weekly in English, serving the Asian American communities. And I guess, Phil, that that's it's part of Asian American history, that it's a now defunct uh, artifact of uh, Asian American history, I guess. <laughs> I was actually part of the New York Nietzsche Bay also, which is another defunct. Uh, uh, hopefully I will keep the University of Maryland open here. My record is pretty bad about staying, keeping organizations you know, afloat. <laughs> well, yeah, you were mine both. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we're now going on a podcast to tell people about these stories, which just shows you... Uh, just uh, how the technology has changed and how the, the means of getting across information to people about important Asian American issues uh, has changed over the years. So, so thanks for joining me. Okay, my pleasure. Well, we're talking, um, you know, to, to catch up, but this is also the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. And it was signed on February 19th by 1942 by President Franklin Roosevelt. And, you know, it's funny, most people, I guess uh, when they hear that, they, they know it existed, but I guess they're always startled that Roosevelt signed it. Or, or is, Has that been your impression over the years? Yes, when people think of uh, President Roosevelt, the, the second President Roosevelt, actually, there was also Teddy Roosevelt, who was quite a rabble-rouser back right. at the turn of the 20th century. But Franklin Roosevelt was from quite a patrician family, uh, but he ended up being the man who helped out the quote-unquote common man and woman quite a bit because he... Uh, set in motion quite a few uh, things that would help get us out of the depression and that would help put work, uh, put people back to work and put food on the table. And also in terms of civil rights, civil liberties, he did some things that were very good. But in this case, he participated in something that was quite bad and which history has judged uh, very badly for him and others who participated in it. Was was he coerced, or was it just the xenophobic politics, or the World War II uh, frenzy, or what was it that made him sign nine zero six six? Because uh, we'll talk about the consequences. But uh, what do you think about the politics of the day? And do you think it's anything quite like the politics today? Well, you have to look a little bit at the history of the Roosevelt family. They were China traders. They were people who uh, knew about Asia. Uh, Franklin had gone and served as an assistant secretary of the Navy, just like his cousin Theodore before. And so he actually was quite enamored of the Navy and of ships, and he was quite uh, 
supportive of China and not supportive of the growing Japanese threat to China, Russia, everybody else in the Eastern sphere. And so I think he might have been predisposed to do things against Japan and maybe Japanese Americans. But aside from that, he uh, had some political issues he had to deal with. And like any politician, he made some decisions based on what was convenient for him. We'll be talking about how the camps got set up and everything, but at the end, when it was time to take the camps down, he delayed that decision for six months, partly because he wanted to win the November 1944 election. And so in December 1944, the camps uh, were officially closed. Um, there was a Supreme Court decision that came down, but uh, many people say he could have closed them earlier. Maybe he didn't have to even open them, because, in fact, there were two reports, a Munson report and a Ringel report right. that were done by people who said, hey, these Japanese Americans are pretty loyal. You don't have to round them all up, just like you're not planning to round up all the German Americans and all the Italian Americans. Yeah, but they, but those reports were ignored, and we, we will get to that. But let's talk about this executive order. Essentially, it's no different from what uh, President Trump is signing now. It's an executive order, Right. Right. Well, there are several ways that the uh, executive, the chief executive of our country, the president, can have power. So a president can make proclamations saying, you know, happy 100th birthday to somebody or, uh, you know, something a little lighter. And then there can be uh, memos where the president can say, this is generally what my policy is going to be. And when there's actually an executive order, this is something that has the force of law. It does not have to go through the Congress. It's listed in the Federal Register, and it's pretty serious. I mean, just the way President Trump is using it, President Obama used it, everybody uses it to some extent. But uh, in this case, it was used by uh, President Roosevelt at the behest of people within the War Department. And don't forget, we called the Defense Department the War Department before uh, right. and during World War II. <laughs> so. Right. Uh, <laughs> And the, and the, and the ultimate thing was the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans. But let's just read a little bit from 9066. It begins, whereas the successful prosecution of the war requires every possible protection against espionage and against sabotage to national defense material, national defense premises, and national defense ut- utilities. And then it goes on and cites all these sections. But essentially, it's a nas- this is a national security justification, right? Right. No different and, than, the, say, the Muslim ban, or no different than, say, the travel ban. Right, and it was based on equally specious factual predicates here, because, uh, as we just pointed out, uh, the uh, Navy man Ringel and the special operative Munson had done their reports and said there wasn't this big problem. Uh, other people within the military and others said, you know, there really isn't this big problem of Japanese Americans. So um, this notion of military necessity that was played upon by uh, people in the military and frankly by a lot of growers on the West Coast, um, other people who saw the Japanese Americans as being competitors because don't forget the Japanese uh, had come, including my grandfather and many other Japanese uh, immigrants had come. And they had settled all over the West Coast and in California, just one example, they had helped to build the truck farming industry, bringing a lot of fresh produce into the big cities. They were doing very good work, oftentimes starting with very bad land. And they were, in fact, some of the most educated people on the West Coast. Many of them had up to eighth grade education, which was quite a lot at the time. They were very cohesive as a community. They learned certain procedures and they taught them to each other. So the Japanese... Americans were very good at what they were doing and were seen as a threat by some people who wanted to create uh, farms for themselves and take away their land. Yeah, and as we speak, I'm just a stone's throw away from some of the most fertile land in in the world, the California Central Valley, uh, where uh, this is where those those Japanese farmers uh, were posed that threat to to the growers and 
and they lost their land when they were forced to, uh, when they were restricted by 9066. Actually, it wasn't just 9066. As you know, there was that one-two punch just a few weeks after, on March 9th, 1942. Uh, Roosevelt signed Public Law 503, and it made it a misdemeanor and uh, punishable uh, up to 5,000 in fines and a year in prison if one did not uh, uh, comply with the executive order. And this is when really uh, the the mass incarceration of the Japanese and Japanese Americans began. Well, don't forget that uh, there was also a one, two, three punch because preceding 9066 was Presidential Proclamation 2537, which called for the registration of immigrants from enemy countries, including Germany, Italy, and Japan. Right. And that is the one that most closely resembles to uh, Trump's request to have a, a Muslim registry. And again, um, there are immigration records for people. And what we found in the Japanese-American case was that uh, postal records were used to track down some people in the Japanese-American community. I have pictures that I've seen in the New York Japanese American community where I grew up after the war. And there were intelligence officers who were taking pictures of every Japanese American gathering before the war. And you can see some of those pictures if you do a FOIA request. Um, they, the intelligence agencies were concerned about what was happening in Italy and Germany and Japan, and they didn't want anything bad to happen here. But let's not forget, the Germans were having giant goose-stepping rallies in Madison Square Garden and marching down Fifth Avenue in New York City. So they were, in my opinion, an even bigger threat because uh, uh, they were, you know, out and out. uh, They're more demonstrative. The very demonstrative Nazis. And so that's what created the uh, uh, contrast between what happened to the German Italian Americans and then what happened to the much smaller numbers of Japanese Americans? Well, a lot of people don't realize that there were uh, somewhere around eleven thousand uh, people of German ancestry who were who were incarcerated, as well as uh, maybe uh, a lesser number of Italians, like maybe three thousand or so. But yeah, the Japanese it was about one hundred and twenty thousand, and seventy thousand of the ja- of those were Japanese American. So they were American, and that's. I think to this day that's that is always the fact that always gets me and always um you know just stuns people when they say well they were Americans uh, you know cuz they they see them as the enemy and that that well, speaks and, directly to the xenophobia of the issue. Well and and there's a very 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 important lesson from that time that we need to remember today which is the words we use have to be very very carefully analyzed. So for example the Executive Order 9066 was followed by civilian exclusion orders done by the military saying aliens and non-aliens must be evacuated from certain areas. Now, let's analyze what's wrong with that. If I said to you, citizens and non-citizens have to be evacuated, you'd say, hey, wait a minute, citizens are going to be put behind barbed wire? And it would have raised a lot more concerns. So as we think about what's happening to our Muslim brothers and sisters today, we've got to remember that many of them are citizens. And let's call a citizen a citizen. If something happens, we should not allow that language of aliens and non-aliens to be used. Then the euphemism evacuated was used, which is more of a benign term. You know, you're evacuated because a dam is potentially going to spill or you're evacuated because... A hurricane has come through. It's it's something that government does as a necessary function. But the quote-unquote evacuation of Japanese Americans was done for specific political reasons, um, supposedly for military reasons, but we found out that wasn't true. The other thing we have to remember is that the wartime civilian uh, uh, conservation authority, WCCA, was used. It's a military group. A civilian control administration was used to take the Japanese Americans out of their homes and put them in the camps. And then the WRA, the Wartime Relocation Administration, was the group that uh, held them in the camps and uh, administered food and other things over the next couple of years. But again, you have to ask yourself, why were two government agencies involved here? And that gives you a little peephole into what was happening within the government. 
because some of the military people who were on the side of Secretary of War Stimson, John L. DeWitt, who was the Western Defense Command uh, commander, Carl Bendetson, who was an Army strategist, John J. McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War. These people very much wanted the Japanese Americans put behind barbed wire. <sighs> Francis Biddle, Edward Ennis, other people from the Department of Justice said, no, their civil liberties, particularly those of the U.S. citizens, are being abridged. So because of that struggle, uh, the military were the ones who used the WCCA to put people behind the barbed wire, and then they turned it over to the WRA. So yeah. again, anyone who's looking at what happens today with our Muslim brothers and sisters, be very vigilant about who's doing this. Think about whether it's allowed by the Constitution and by our Bill of Rights. Uh, it's very important not to let the government use euphemisms to take people who are citizens and take away their rights. Well, you know, it's so important that that language part, because you look at 9066, there's no mention of camp or incarceration. It, it, it makes it sound not necessarily, well, as benign as they could, but it makes it all sound justifiable. And if you're not paying attention, you could say, yeah, it's okay that we should do this. You know, you could see how people could be lulled into thinking, were there people Were there in the public? Was there... Uh, any hue and cry to 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 say no? We know that there were Japanese Americans, some who said no, but was there a hue and cry from the public? There were some people, like the Quakers, the uh, uh, the Friends, who uh, did a lot of work to help the Japanese Americans. Uh, there were people in the ACLU of Northern California. You know, there were a few people, but a lot of people saw what FDR was doing, they saw the war effort, and they said, well, we're kind of concerned about this, but maybe I'll just keep my mouth shut for now because there's so many other things happening in the world. And again, that's a very important lesson for us now because as you let your rights get eroded away at a certain point, you know, there's nobody left to come for you. So right. you've got to uh, think about that. Um also realize uh, another euphemism that was used uh, throughout Asian American history. Um, there were regulations such as alien land laws, which said aliens ineligible for citizenship cannot own land. And again, they didn't want to say, oh, we hate the Chinese or we hate the Japanese. They would just say something like that. And you read the law and it says, oh, aliens who are ineligible for citizenship. And then you realize the only ones who were ineligible were a certain group of people. So again, as we look at EO9, uh, EO9066 and we look at um, Public Law 503 and we look at the um, various exclusion orders, we have to be careful when they say the military is going to have certain powers, doesn't quite enumerate all of them, and it says the military commander shall have the discretion. Again, it didn't say we hate Japanese or we're going to take all the Japanese and put them behind barbed wire. But what ended up happening was people who had that animus went ahead and did that and did not do something comparable to the German and Italian Americans, although right. I, I would have hopefully protested that as well. There was no whole, oh, there was no wholesale roundup of the German and Italian Americans. As you pointed out, there were about 11,000 German Americans out of the about 1.1 million who were in the country, and there were about 3,000 Italian Americans, but... These people, by and large, were identified as being people who had some Nazi sympathies, and many of them had some type of a hearing. The biggest problem was that entire group of people, based on their national origin, were rounded up and put behind barbed wire, irrespective of their political views, their religion, anything else. They just took the whole group of people. And that mass roundup is something that violates all the principles that we stand for in this country. Well, you know, it, it must also, uh, be partly because when you, when you look at Germans, you look at Italians, they were white, even though of Euro American, of Euro descent, but they were white. Japanese and Japanese Americans were Asian, and that, that had to play into the distinction, no? Well, also, I think they had done something that Asian Americans learned from and did later themselves, which is to get themselves into the political process. It's hard to round up somebody named LaGuardia when that guy is the mayor of New York City. 
It's hard right. to round up somebody named DiMaggio when he is a world-famous baseball player. So as Japanese Americans saw that they had been excluded from the law, f- excluded from politics, excluded from business, uh, they realized after the war that part of the reason they were so isolated and didn't have the allies they needed was because they had been pushed out, but partly they realized they themselves had to jump in and get started. So we see after the war, particularly after the 60s, 70s, 80s, many more of us got involved in politics, ran for right. office, got involved in things, and broke down some of those barriers. Well, we know that uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Norman Mineta, the, the Honorable Norman Mineta, became mayor of San Jose and then went on to Congress and then went on to become uh, a member of uh, both the, the Bush administration and the Clinton administration cabinet. So um, that's one example. And, and of course, uh, he was behind the, the major legislation that brought the, uh, the, uh, you know, the Civil Liberties Act of 88, which brought the, uh, the, the reparations or, uh, what, what is the, what is the political correct term for that? Uh, well, some people call it redress, some call it reparations. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, um, what happened, um, you want me to get into the whole? Reading well, you know, I, I don't know if we get time. I mean, I, I hate to cut the to give short shrift to Norm here because this is the the flip side of nine oh six six. What happens in the end and the apology? But let's cover that another time uh, because I know the time is short here. Um, but just. We'll footnote it that, you know, there was redress uh, of this issue. But uh, let's talk more about 9066 and the the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans, because I know it's been a big part of your own personal family history. And how did it affect you, uh, Phil? I I know that one of the things when I asked you to to talk about this, I I knew you had um, an intimate knowledge of the history, but also a very close one because of your family. Well, uh, part of the reason I went into the legal profession was because of what had happened to my family. Uh, my mother's uh, Tajitsu family, her parents had come from Japan, and they were living up in Seattle. My mom was one of the, uh, my grandmother was one of the first uh, women who served as a teacher in the Japanese school there. Uh, my grandfather was a community leader, was uh, drove a truck, uh, did wholesaling, um, and during the uh, late 1940s, uh, uh, I mean in 1941, uh, they heard about this uh, possibility of rounding people up. And so as soon as uh, the uh, Pearl Harbor happened, my grandfather immediately sent my aunt out to the East Coast so that she was able to take a train, the last train out of Seattle going east before some of these restrictions took place. Uh, my other aunt was already going to school at Juilliard in New York City. But then my mom and her younger sister and brother went to the camps with my grandparents. So they went to P- uh, Puyallup, which is the assembly center in uh, Seattle. And then they went to Minidoka, which was the camp in Idaho. And my mom got out to become a nurse cadet. Many uh, Japanese Americans got involved as interpreters, or they fought for the very decorated 442nd Regiment, uh, Regimental Combat Team, or the 100th Battalion. Lesser known is that my mom and others became nurse cadets to try and help out the war effort by becoming nurses. So um, that's how it affected my family directly. And then after the war, I was born in the 1950s. Uh, people weren't talking about it at that time. And as the civil rights movement was heating up in the 1960s, many of us started saying, hey, uh, what happened? How You were on the West Coast. How come some of you aren't on the West Coast anymore? And mm. my family was one of the ones that moved to the East Coast. And it started coming out that our families have been put behind barbed wire. So I remember I was in New York City back in the 1970s, and then... Um, I was wondering about this. I did a survey at the local Christian and Buddhist churches in the Japanese American community and found out that many people there were interested in getting redress for this, but they didn't know how and they didn't want to make a public fuss about it because many people didn't want to rock the boat. 
They had mm-hmm. already been put behind barbed wire for who they were, and they just wanted to get on with their lives and not make a fuss. But as some of the younger generation, including myself, went to law school and started pushing for redress, uh, many of the Nisei, the second generation people like my mom, became very active. They were in leadership positions. People like William Horry helped to f- uh, push for a class action suit. People like Norm Mineta, who you just mentioned, and Spark Matsunaga in Congress helped to push for legislative redress. Many of us wrote articles, including you and people on the West Coast. Uh, everybody was writing articles about what was happening and doing public education. And a quorum nobis case was filed. And these are cases that sought to overturn the wartime convictions of uh, Hirabayashi and Yasui and Korematsu, the three gentlemen who had tried to protest these camps using lawsuits back in the 1940s. So these quorum nobis cases were successful to the extent that the factual predicate of these cases was uh, undermined. Anybody who says these cases can still be used to put Japanese Americans behind barbed wire is not telling the truth. Uh, Maybe that's alternate facts. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, 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 you know, but but you mentioned Korematsu, and we just had uh, Fred Korematsu's uh, celebration uh, in January. And, and I've written about this, how his case went to the Supreme Court. And I've talked to Deal Manami, a, a lawyer who told me that even though the lower court's ruling was overturned, since the federal government did not appeal, the Supreme Court case was never Never reversed. So technically, uh, that Supreme Court upholding against Korematsu is still on the books. Is, is that a correct reading? And, and you know, when I talked to Dale, he said, you know, well, I didn't ask him this because I haven't talked to him subsequent or since Trump has been elected president. But could that law still or that ruling on the Supreme Court still on the books? Could that be used? to justify uh, some kind of mass roundup? Well, the Korematsu case is studied in every law school. Every law student studies it. Um, It's seen as uh, part of a line of what they call heightened scrutiny cases, where if the government does something against a particular group of people, in this case a racial minority, they have to look very, very, very carefully and see whether it is justified to do that. Because if the government is not justified to do that, then it should not be allowed to do that. And so um, Korematsu has been discredited by many people. But as you and Dale have pointed out, it hasn't been fully overturned the way that Brown versus Board overturned the Plessy versus Ferguson case from the 19th century. Uh, So it's still on the books. And it's still, as Justice Jackson said in dissent, it's lying there like a loaded weapon ready for somebody else to use. And we like to think that the facts have been shown to be uh, false because uh, what the Coram Nobis case has proved, and, and Dale was the lead lawyer on this, was that the government was hiding some evidence that um, uh, essentially John DeWitt, the De- Western Defense Command com- uh, commander, said, you know, a Jap is a Jap. There's no way we could tell who's loyal no matter how much time we have. And then some people cleaned it up a little and said, uh, excuse me, General DeWitt, you can't say something like that. You just have to say we didn't have time to figure it out who was loyal. Because frankly, look at England. At the time, they were being bombed by the Nazis, and they were able to separate the loyal from the disloyal Germans who were staying in their country. Well, so, well how about, could, could you just go forward and, and to the, the present day with, with Muslims? Uh, could the, the same argument be made there that, well, how, how do we know who's loyal? You know, how do we know who's gonna, uh, who's gonna be more loyal to Islam than to the United States? And should we be fearful of that happening again? Well, uh, two things we have to remember before we even address that question, which is we have many Muslim Americans who've been here, like the Japanese Americans were, for one, two, three or more generations. You look around places like Detroit, uh, you know, in Michigan, there are huge uh, Muslim American communities. Um, and when people come into this country, there's fear about who's coming in. The process of vetting refugees and immigrants to come in is so strict, so arduous that, uh, you know, it takes sometimes up to two years. 
So if you're worrying if somebody's going to walk in with dynamite around their vest, you know, and just come in and start blowing things up, that, that's it's it's laughable if you really understand the processes. Mm-hmm. Now, um, as people start to make broad-based allegations about all Muslims are doing anything, I immediately cringe. Now we're talking about uh, Muslims and, and Arabs and people of Islam. Uh, you were saying that we now have several generations of these uh, members of the community who who are are here, and and, and how is that going to stop this this dormant Supreme Court case that could suddenly come alive? Well, I think that there is a very good chance that we can prevent another Korematsu for several reasons. First of all, um, through our redress movement to uh, educate the public about what happened to the Japanese Americans and pushing for redress through the legislature, through the courts, with a class action suit, we essentially, quote unquote, vaccinated the public about what happened. Uh, I wrote a piece for the Yale Law Journal. Other people wrote uh, pieces in many other journals. Uh, so uh, an entire generation of lawyers has grown up hearing about this. Uh, on top of that, the redress movement was successful uh, in Congress. And in fact, the uh, redress bill was passed in 1988, signed by President Reagan. The authorization for $20,000 per person and an apology was signed by President George H.W. Bush. And, you know, uh, over a billion dollars was given out to people, over 60,000 people. So the government said, we made a mistake. And uh, President Ford wrote a proclamation in 1976 that said, we made a mistake. So many people on both sides of the political aisle have said, this Japanese American uh, internment was wrong. And we, as a country that values civil rights, civil liberties, the right to property, the right to all the First Amendment guarantees. This is something we should not do. So that is part of the reason why I don't think it could happen again. The second Trump or no Trump. Trump Trump or no Trump. 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 Yeah. Uh, But on top of that, the uh, Muslim American community is very organized, and they are comprised of people who've been here for several generations, just like the Japanese Americans. They have been very smart about getting themselves involved in the political scene. So if you look at the state of Michigan, there are people who are uh, very involved in politics, supporting their uh, politicians in and around Detroit, where there's a large Muslim American community. Um, And they are standing up very vocally for their rights and working with people in the union movement and other movements. Uh, So they have learned some of the lessons about staying outside the political system that Japanese Americans uh, had not learned before World War II, partly because they were pushed out and partly because they chose not to. Yeah, you know, we we come up to this 75th anniversary of 9066. It's a President's Day weekend. We're talking about a, an executive order. And then the, the, the coming week, we have President Trump talking about issuing a new tailored travel ban that will take into account uh you know what the uh what the uh the district court or what the uh the, the ninth circuit court uh ruled uh, into uh you know into uh its uh thinking as it as it crafts the order but I guess, in a way, do you fear that they might be doing what, uh, say, looking at what made 9066 permissible? Do you think that they're, they're, they're trying to come up with something that will, um, will be innocuous sounding, but still, uh, have the kind of maximum, uh, xenophobic benefit? Well, I don't doubt that some of these people who are in the current administration have some of this animus about wanting to lock up or exclude certain people. Uh, like I said, Presidential Proclamation 2537, which happened before EO 9066, did actually call for a registration of immigrants from enemy countries. And again, remember that words are used in a way to obfuscate. So we have this quote-unquote war on terror. Um, if we had a war on China, it was very clear who the enemy is and when you know, we would know who could sign a peace treaty at the end because it's a state. When you're fighting against terror, what is terror? Who defines it? 
who are the enemies, when can they sign a peace treaty, it's unclear. So when you're starting to lump people from these seven countries as opposed to those other countries, these are the people who uh, have done certain things to the U.S. or not, these are countries where President Trump has business interests or not, you know, it's, it's creating a lot of confusion. And frankly, people who are public policy experts look at these Trump executive orders and say, excuse me, if you really want to protect Americans, you don't do things that, first of all, inflame the hatred of people who do want to hurt the United States. And second of all, you don't do things that will keep scholars and athletes and other people out of this country. Many students are going to go to Canada and go to other places to study. Many conferences are going to be held in other places. Our scientific community is going to suffer. You know, the way that the Trump administration is doing these exclusions is just wrong. They, they just don't understand the fundamentals of public policy and politics. But from a civil, from a civil liberties point of view, I look at what they're trying to do and fanning the flames of hatred against one group of people. Uh, that is what is done by dictators and by people who benefit from people being divided and worried about their neighbors and thinking that this problem that they're facing in terms of uh, uh, employment issues. There's so many issues that we as Americans face, and frankly, the Muslim Americans are not causing <laughs> these problems. They are yeah. suffering just like everyone else. So as we listen to these calls to be afraid of our Muslim brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves, who is saying this? Who's going to benefit from this? And maybe if we look back at the history of what was done against Japanese Americans, we realize the Japanese Americans were not the problem. There was never a Japanese American on American soil who was convicted of treason or sabotage. They went to these camps. They went on to serve in the intelligence services, uh, on the battlefields of Europe. They f served as nurses. Uh, they did many things. They shed a lot of blood, and they proved their Americanness. But frankly, why did they have to do that? It was because yeah. of ignorance and a lack of knowledge about Asian American history and Asian American communities before the war. Is is it just me, or is there, there a sense that this is a more heightened time than, than ever, uh, say within the last, say, 20 years? Oh, it's a much more heightened time because of the uh, expressed vow to crack down on immigration, to uh, exclude certain people based on their religion. Uh, this type of rhetoric is what some people call a dog whistle. And again, there's euphemisms that are used. You don't say, I hate a particular thing. You just say, well, what if we keep people out from these seven countries? And then you look at those seven countries and realize that the majority of people in those countries are Muslim. So um, we have to be very vigilant when President Trump and people in his administration say things, analyze it very carefully, make sure that something really is being done to help the security of the United States, make sure that it does not violate the Bill of Rights or any rights of Americans, and make sure that there are no code words that are being used that sound fair, but which, when implemented, are going to be unfair toward any group of people. Yeah, and and on a personal note for you, Phil, I know um, they these uh, you know this day of remembrance. Everyone I talk to who is of Japanese American descent always takes it very very personal. Uh, well, what's it mean to you personally, especially you know in 2017? Well. I was honored and privileged to be part of the redress movement and to have played some small role in helping to get the uh, legislation passed and get the uh, lawsuits uh, through the courts. But at the same time, I realized that the rights of other people were still in jeopardy. And that's why I became a civil rights lawyer and worked with the African-American community, the Latino community, with the women's rights community. I was a very strong advocate for marriage equality, for the LGBT community. Um, I realized that civil rights and civil liberties are not safe for any person unless they're available to every person. So I think Japanese Americans who participated in this redress movement, many of them have gone on to do other things, as they should, because we can't just think about the rights of any one group. We should be thinking about the rights of every group. 
Phil, thank you very much for spending this time with me. It's always good to talk to you. And uh, I guess you wish one another a happy day of remembrance, or how do you, when you greet another uh, Japanese American or another Asian American about uh, that day, is it uh, just, it just seems somber. It's not really a celebration. Well, Yes, it, I mean, happy day of remembrance, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it is a way to reflect on our families, our parents, our grandparents, in some cases, great grandparents and others who yeah. had their lives foreshortened and their opportunities uh, limited. And I think it's important to think about that and say, I'm sorry it happened to them, and maybe through our actions we could make sure that it doesn't happen to any other people. So to that extent, it is a celebration because we're helping to make it possible. All right, Phil, thank you very much for joining me and uh, and for taking part in this podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, are you doing anything special on, on uh, Day of, Rem- of Remembrance? Yeah, we have a program here at the Smithsonian. Um, if you go to uh, AmericanHistory.si.edu, there is a major exhibit that is opening about EO9066. It's not quite a replacement for A More Perfect Union, which was the exhibit that opened and closed years ago, but it is a um, commemoration. It does have many objects that were collected from Japanese Americans, and it does tell the story about Executive Order 9066 and what happened as a result of that. So mm-hmm. it's very important that uh, we here in the D.C. community are uh, commemorating that. I'll be at the program. I'll be answering questions. I'm going to be doing a program at the University of Maryland, um, and people around the country are calling me, and I'm talking about things. So it's very important that we keep this memory alive, and I'm just one of many people who's trying to do that. Yeah. Is there any one particular, uh, you know, uh, thing in the, in the exhibit that, uh, that struck you that, uh, you know, that was a, a solemn moment as you went over the exhibit? Well, one very personal one is a suitcase that has the name Watanabe on it. And mm. my friend Barbara Watanabe, and her aunt, Chiyoko Watanabe, who I knew in New York many years ago, are part of that family. And so this piece of luggage was used by their family to go from their home in Seattle into the camps. So seeing that is a very stark reminder that this is people who I know very well and care about. And their family went in just like my family went in. And yeah. there's many, many other objects like that that are related to people I know and and others I don't know, but whose rights and liberties and opportunities I care about. Yeah, and do you ever think about the people who went east and were able to uh, escape or to not not escape, but to to uh, just not be part of the the roundup? Do you ever think about that? Well. Some people made choices to do that. Some people had the opportunities to do that. Don't forget, there were people living paycheck to paycheck back then, just the way there are now. So even if we hear about things happening here, it's not like people can escape to Canada. You know, (laughs) People have to uh, have the economic wherewithal to do that. So, um, yes, there were people who were living outside the exclusion areas on the West Coast. I did some research that found that there were roundups and internments of people here on the East Coast. People living in New York City, for example, were taken out to Ellis Island. Some of them were taken down to Fort Meade in Maryland, and then they were taken out to the camps in the West. So um, this roundup happened not just on the West Coast, but on the East Coast. There were roundups in Hawaii, Alaska. Um, So it was something that happened all over the country, and it could happen again. And as we've discussed, uh, part of what we have Part of what we have to do is to make sure that it doesn't. And that's Phil Tajitsu Nash, Asian American history professor at the University of Maryland, on the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. And that's going to be the podcast. 
I'm Emil Guillermo. Read my latest on the ALDEF blog. That's the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog. That's at aaldef.org slash blog. And join us again next time for Emil Amuck's Takeout.